Well, welcome to your introduction to the brain. We are going to use the sheep brain as a stand-in for the human brain. You'll see there are very many similarities, a few little differences, basically size. You can notice it's quite a bit smaller. At any rate, the first thing we want to notice, you always want to examine your specimen externally first, identify as many structures as you possibly can before you do any cutting. Everybody wants to jump right into the cutting there, but okay, so on the outside we'll see a whitish material. If it's white, hopefully you'll remember what type of tissue it is. Dense, regular, connective tissue. Much like tendons, this outer layer, very much like a knight in shining armor, is the most durable and toughest outermost layer okay, of three important protective layers or membranes on the central nervous system. These are called meninges. Some of you may be familiar with meningitis, which would be an inflammation in one of these layers. This outermost meninge is really tough. It's called the dura mater or mater. Some people learn it as mater, M-A-T-E-R. Um, same root word as alma mater when you talk about your college that you went to or um, when you graduate, that's how you'll talk about this college. Um, dura, like in durable, meaning very tough. So this is one tough mother right here. So we're going to, if you use a scalpel, unfortunately, not a good choice because when you use a scalpel on something like this, you'll cut and cut and cut trying to get this to open. It's very tough, like Tyvek, like those uh, postal envelopes that you pick up at the post office that cannot be torn or what they wrap houses in for insulating. Um, so you'll push and push and push, and by the time it actually gets through there, you'll smush that delicate brain tissue underneath. So I recommend a nice pair of pointy-tipped scissors. You can either find an opening, and this one has one right here, or if you can't find an opening, you can pinch, pinch a little bit of a of that tissue between the tips of those scissors, just a little spot, make a little hole, and now get the point of your scissor in there, and as if you were opening a delicate package where you didn't want to hurt anything inside, you snip along that dura, kind of lifting the tips of your scissors as you go. I find it's very helpful to actually go all the way around and try and pull it off. It's really tough back here. It actually has, sometimes may have a little bit of residual bone left from the cranium, of the sheep. This one doesn't seem to, but you could have a real heck of a time doing that. Now, underneath this, there's going to be a second layer. Unfortunately, in preserved sheep brains, you don't always see that layer very well. Um, it's called the arachnoid mater, and like our knight in shining armor, it's a mesh or a network like his chain mail would be, or hers, like Joan of Arc. We don't want to be sexist here. Um, but you, and I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's a little connection here. It looks like a spider web. As I pull this back, I can see some little spider webby connections. It's not as visible from the superior surface of the brain. But when you flip the brain over sometimes, as you're pulling it away, you can see more spider webby right in here. There's some spider webby material that represents the, the looser connective tissue of the arachnoid mater. And down in here, you can see that this is really webby looking. This is your arachnoid mater. And you want some spaces in there. Blood vessels will run through here. Uh, cerebrospinal fluid will flow or circulate through this layer. Um, and again, that's like the chain mail. So there's little openings. Okay, now, we're down to our third layer. I'm going to try and delicately that dura goes right down and around our other um, uh, brain stem structures and then it, it covers or wraps around some of the major cranial nerves for instance the optic nerve which we're going to hopefully see here shortly I'm going to try and cut that dura or the, the tough connective tissue off the outside of this nerve and see if we can Peel it off of there. Brr. Sort of a delicate operation. Now you can see why the neurologists get paid the big bucks. Of course, we're dealing with a dead brain, but imagine if this were alive. The responsibility. Oh my goodness. Okay. Ugh. Tough stuff. Doesn't want to come off of there. Come off of there, you. We'll kind of cut it like that. We want to try and keep one of our connections to the 
structures of the eye. We don't have the whole eye here, but we have some of the residual structures that they do leave on. They do a nice job giving us kind of the material here to see how this is all connected together. And what you can see is some fat from the back of the eye in the orbit. You can see where the optic nerve pops out right here. Let's see if I can turn that sideways, a little profile action there. It's very white, nice and round, tough. Nerves are very tough. There are many layers of connective tissue in there wrapped around all those fascicles. And so let me see if I can get the rest of this dura off of here. That dura wants to protect this brain and it just doesn't want to let go. So be thankful to your duras. They take good care of you. Prevent things like meningitis most of the time. Wow! Come off of there, you silly thing. There we go. I think now we may have a little better view. Come away. Okay, so now we're going to trim this right off of here. Snip. Oop, don't want to do that optic nerve. Snap. Okay. Now, we want to see the pia mater, and then we'll come back and look at the underside, the inferior side of the brain. Pia mater. Pia stands for tender. Now, this is the tender mother, and this would be like, you know, if a knight in shining armor had a virile, hairy chest. He wouldn't want to put his chain mail on there. He'd get all those little hairs caught. That would be terrible. So there's a lovely, soft, thin layer on the inside. The knight might use cotton or silk or something that's tender to the flesh underneath. This pia mater, when you look at it, looks a lot like saran wrap. It's transparent. It's extremely thin. If you've ever had a sunburn and had your skin peel, that is about how thick, the peeling skin there was about how thick this pia mater is. It's, it's uh, again, a very thin layer of dense regular connective tissue. It's very tough stuff. I'm going to try and peel some of that off of there. You can barely see it. If you can grab a little edge of it, sometimes you can you can peel uh, maybe. See when I peel that away how thin? I don't know if that shows up in the film very well, but very very thin material. Kind of mangling my brain a little bit here, but that's right. I want to demonstrate to you that while I think this pia mater isn't really doing much, I can really push quite firmly on this brain tissue here with the pia mater on and doesn't change or affect it. It doesn't change the shape. It doesn't indent or anything, and it springs right back to its normal shape. If I take a piece of brain that has the pia mater removed and I just touch it lightly, my probe, my dissecting needle goes right in there very easily. And then I get to the part where there's pia. I'm pushing with the same amount of strength. Nothing's happening. So you can see that even though it's very thin, it actually does a very good job protecting that material. We call the these raised areas, what I would describe as little hills, we call those a gyrus for a single, or gyri for the plural. We call the little spaces down in between, which I can't really get into because my pia mater is over there, but if I cut through my pia mater, I can really get down in there and do a blunt probe. You can see that there are actually grooves. We learned this back when we learned bones. They're called a sulcus for a singular, or sulci for the plural. Some people say sulci, some people say gyrus instead of gyrus. Um, either one is fine. We have some bigger grooves on the brain surface. Um, the major groove that divides this longitudinally is called the longitudinal fissure. We're going to cut through that here shortly so we can take a look at things. Um, sometimes it is described as the commissural fissure, C-O-M-M-I-S-U-R-A-L, because it, it is the crack just above the bridge between the right and the left hemispheres, and a commissure is a bridge or connection of white matter tracts or fibers that connect across the brain. So this goes down and stops right where we have the crossroads that go through there, the commissures. So then we have a couple of sulci, not as visible on the sheep brain, on the human brain, between the frontal area and the parietal lobes, frontal lobes and parietal lobes of the brain, you'll see a, a, a groove that goes across 
um, in a, like the same as a coronal or frontal suture, and that's called the central sulcus. And then if you flip the brain sideways, and again, you don't see this quite as well in a sheep as you do in a human brain, but there's a groove right here between the temporal lobe and the rest, and that's called the lateral sulcus. So there's is kind of buried down in here a little bit. Um, that lateral sulcus opens up into an inner fold in the human brain called the insula. Um, it's just like a, it's an inner layer of more of these gyri. Um, if we look at the brain from a lateral view, let's see if we can get that lined up pretty well, you'll notice there's sort of a smaller brain and a larger brain. Now in the sheep, that larger brain isn't a whole lot larger. But in a human being, it would be much more pronounced, and then this smaller brain would be quite a bit smaller. Our general rule with Latin is, the longer the name, the tinier the structure. So the cerebellum is this small brain area. The cerebrum, which is the shorter name, is the much bigger, more um, what we call the higher brain. This is where we have higher order functions going on. We call most of these, oh, this area where there's these folds and grooves, we call it the cortex. The cortex kind of grows up like a stem, comes up like a flower, and the petals fold down around that brain stem again. So this part right here, this brain stem in here, which we'll take a look at when we cut this in half, we do a sagittal section, this brain stem is um, referred to, the, the lowest part is referred to as the medulla oblongata. It's the medulla because the cortex is in the middle, and the cortex grows down around it, covering it. Many other structures in the body have a medulla and a cortex, um, kidneys, uh, lymph glands, um, adrenal glands. So this is the first time in our experience in AMP1 that we really talked about a cortex and a medulla. It's not quite as mm, accurate in terms of being in the middle and then surrounded by a layer, but you kind of see it. So if we flip the brain over and we look at the, post, the inferior side, what we can see, I'm going to put this aside just for a moment, what we can see coming out the front, very, very well developed olfactory nerves on sheep, very dependent on their sense of smell. They have a better olfactory tract than we do, more developed. Um, their optic nerves are quite well developed. They have good vision. Um, and what happens, what you'll notice with optic nerves is that they have an area where they cross, it makes an X, which we refer to as the optic chiasma. The letter X in the Greek alphabet is referred to as chi, or chi. Some people say chi. Um, I learned it as the chiasma. So you see this X marks the spot, and that brings information from this um, right eye back to the right side of the brain and also to the left side of the brain. So it can crisscross both of those, and that helps with um, not only 3D vision but general um, visual interpretation. Um, now, if I kind of pull that aside, then we and we move down the pike here a little bit, you can see more of the stem structures. We're going to cut into it now so we can really see on the inside. So now we're going to do a sagittal section. We're going to start at the medulla down here, which actually looks kind of like brain stem. My hand is blocking the view here. Sorry, folks. There we go. I'm going to go right up the middle of the cerebellum. I'm going to go right up the middle of the longitudinal fissure or commissural fissure. And we'll have a lovely sagittal section, similar to what you'll see in the human anatomy textbook. Okay. We see, when we look at this lateral view, sagittal view, we see the medulla is kind of this widened place of the spinal cord. Then right across the next kind of major structures up, we see the pons, which is a little bit larger in the human. Um, it's an oval, just a small oval here. And then the cerebellum is directly across from that. They're neighbors. I like to think of the cerebellum as the mansion with all the rooms where you store information. And then it looks out over the ponds. So it looks down its lawn and across the lawn to the ponds. And then you can remember they're right next to each other. The next section moving up the brain stem, and in terms of development, the next section that develops in the brain stem is the midbrain. And this is um, involved with relaying sensory information, and it's particularly involved with um, hearing and visual reflexes. Um, then we're going to move up, and you'll see kind of a round or oval. It'll be a little bit darker structure. 
up at the top of this brain stem called the thalamus. And that's the final processing relay station. All information coming from the 